holy crap, you guys got up this early today. <laughs> I, almost, I almost didn't come. I was like, man, that's just too early. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I'm really flattered that, that you're here uh, today. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that this talk would be a little bit different than what you've seen uh, so far. I'm going to try to stick to the time and, uh, and give you a little bit of an idea as to why I'm doing this talk. And um, hopefully you learn uh, a thing or two about artificial intelligence. And you see it in the news all the time. You, see, uh, you hear about it. And at least you'll, you'll know a little bit more, hopefully. Uh, so th there'll be a little bit of a primer. I'll give you some of the risks that AI uh, has, and then how we can use uh, AI and, and questions that this brings up to uh, talk to uh, preachers, to talk to religious people, and, and to bring in the uh, conversation of technology towards the religion side and perhaps use AI as a way to uh, disarm, yet one more tool to disarm uh, the fairy tales that uh, religion teaches. So hopefully I won't put you to sleep, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So I'll give you a, a little bit, uh, uh, let's, let's start with how many uh, Latinos or Hispanics uh, are in the room over here? Wow. I got to tell you. So I asked the same question, uh, I think it was 2013 or so in Texas, about 150 miles from the Mexican border, and I had one person raise their hand uh, in a group about three times the size of this. So we've made some progress, and, and I like it. So I feel like uh, I'll take all credit for that. I'll, I'll take the credit for that. Uh, so first, let me uh, give you just some quick factoids about Hispanics, just so I'm Latino, so I have to do that. Uh, there are 58 million Hispanics in the United States. That's about 18% of the US population. And, and to put it a little bit in perspective, uh, African Americans are about 13, 14% of the US population. And uh, more people speak Spanish in the United States, well, more people speak Spanish uh, in the United States than anywhere else in the world except for Mexico. So more people in the United States speak Spanish than Colombia, Venezuela, Chile, Spain, uh, or anywhere else. I mean, again, it's just to put things a little bit in perspective and, and as to why Hispanic American free thinkers exist to try to tackle that. Now, Hispanics are worry about the same things that we all worry about, about education, about jobs, uh, about uh, defending against uh, you know, the bad guys, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of people that see you know, this large Hispanic population and they get all nervous, oh, this is gonna turn into you know, some uh, Latin American third world country, forget it. 70% you know, of Hispanics uh, today that are 35 or older, uh, speak Spanish, 70%. Uh, that means 30% don't. But when you look at 18 and under, only about 7% of 18 and under speak Spanish fluently. So it's just like any other immigrants, like the Italians, like the Irish, etc. All right, so why am I speaking today? It's actually quite simple. I'm candy for the eye. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, I'm smart. Number three, I'm humble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now that we got that established. Uh, so last week, uh, uh, I received an email from a local high school in Fairfax, Virginia, uh, asking me to speak to about 50 uh, uh, Hispanic students. And in the email, the teacher said, I want you to discuss what career opportunities are there available for Hispanics. I said, what the fuck? All of them. How about all of them? All of them are available. Well, th there is an exception. They, you know, in my neighborhood, uh, there is a position there that only some Hispanics can get. And uh, currently, we have a, you know, there's a clown that has that job, and it's at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> so only Hispanics that are not born in the United States can, you know, only if you're not born in the United States, you cannot be president. Uh, but anyway, so you've heard I'm, I'm CIO, a Chief Information Officer in an aerospace engineering company. Uh, we do a lot of work with AI. By the way, we're in Oklahoma, so I need to clarify, AI is not artificial insemination. <laughs> yes. I, I'm saying it because, you know, there are a lot of cows and things. Okay, anyway. And uh, so I'm also an outspoken atheist or, or, 
or so I understand because a lot of people keep telling me to shut up. Uh, and uh, I figured how maybe I can do a presentation that can demonstrate, you know, perhaps I'll be able to demonstrate that Latinos can pick, up, you know, can pick whatever goddamn job they want. And so this is one that I picked. But by the way, it's a job where there is a lot of underrepresentation uh, uh, Hispanics. And, and I got to tell you, it saddens me to say this, but for 21 years I've been uh, doing uh, IT work, and I've never met a single Hispanic woman that is an IT leader, not one, at any level. And I intend to change that. So that's uh, part of this. All right. So starting. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, I'm hoping that we can create a lot of questions. So that's, that's the main idea. I want to create more questions. I'm not here to give uh, so many answers. So let's start with the definition of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, non-biological intelligence, and it, it typically is described as the things that it can do. So artificial intelligence can uh, do something like visual perception, speech recognition, uh, decision making, uh, translations, things like that. But notice that those definitions say, you know, they, they, they don't really say what it is. They say about the things that it does. So it's more descriptive than anything. So what I'm going to attempt to do is explain to you what I think artificial intelligence is and also, you know, maybe make the analogy that artificial intelligence perhaps we can consider to be artificial life and, and go from there. So for me, intelligence is simply, very simple, is the ability to process information. I mean, that's what your brain does. Even emotions, you, the, your brain lights up and it shows up, uh, you know, all this information moving back and forth uh, everywhere. So the ability to process information. Uh, so, you know, life, and, and I'll make the point a little bit later, but I would say life and intelligence are also independent of substrate, meaning that it, it is independent of the matter that is doing the thinking. So if there's thinking being done, there's information being processed, it doesn't matter. Because think about, you know, we're carbon-based, carbon but think about all the, uh, it, let's, I mean, we, it's a big universe. There might be life out there, and that life may not be carbon-based like we are over here. So I say that the, uh, the life can be, you know, life can be in many forms. We really don't know. We, we really only know one kind of life. But when it comes, we can say that if something is intelligent and, and has feelings and, and, you know, it behaves and acts intelligently, we call it intelligent. So we can agree that a bunch of matter is intelligent because it has this ability to process. So, that, you know, we have a lump of matter in between our ears and uh, some more than others, we can say that, that we got intelligence there, right? So, uh, but really what makes intelligence are the patterns in there. Because you can take this brain and you put it in a blender and now it's not that intelligent. Is that, you know, is that uh, th those patterns that are. And, and, and evidence of this is that science tells us that every atom in your body is not the same atoms that were there 10 years ago. But you're still the same person. And you are the same, you know, so the reason you're still the same person, even though all those atoms are new, is because of those patterns. Those patterns have been kept. And so that's what makes you, you. So I would say that life is the ability to process information while remaining, while retaining its own complexity, you know, having some sort of memory, and also able to replicate itself. So, you know, it's, uh, trying to keep it, you know, as simple so we can determine, you know, what would be life and what won't be life. That's the expression I was expecting everybody to have when I told them all this. <laughs> so you have to have babies, you know. They say. All right, so prove it. I, I, I got to prove what I just said because I know I'm in a room, in a room full of skeptics. <laughs> and uh, so let's, let's start by what you're seeing there. It's a proton and a, and a neutron. And it, science tells us that all matter, and, and some of the physicists might be able to uh, agree with me on this, that all matter uh, in, in the universe is created by three basic elements, something called up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. And those three things make up protons and neutrons, and with neutrons, electrons, and you can make now, you know, atoms, and with atoms you can make <coughs> molecules, and you can make proteins, and you can make, you know, everything comes from there. So all matter in the universe that we know is made out of those three basic things. Now, for those of you that are computer science, all computation, all of it, comes down to something called a NAND gate. 
and you know you see the table there is is quite simple is the same thing as a uh, not and function and basically it's only it gives you you know you do a zero and a zero gives you a one a, it only gives you a zero if it's a one and a one uh, a true or a true so with just that simple table all computation can be done all of it your smartphone i mean your gps everything is done with that so those two basic things that we need, we need matter and we need way to compute, <laughs> is how, you know, the, what the universe uh, does. Now, you'd recognize that from your biology class, it's a neuron, and the neuron it co is composed of uh, matter and, it's compo and it does some computing, and you take a hundred billion of those neurons and, you know, <coughs> consciousness arises. And, uh, but again, remember, it's the patterns, the patterns that matter. Uh, so it's, the, it's how that brain is arranged and how those cells are connected that makes it smart. Same thing with a computer. The, you know, how those electro how electronic parts are put together is that makes it smart, uh, if you want to go from there. So one of the important questions that we have to ask ourselves, uh, by the way, some of you in the, might recognize that picture in the middle uh, uh, from SETI. Uh, they're looking for extraterrestrial, and they, they saw it turned out to be nothing, just by the way. So we haven't found aliens yet. Um, but imagine that we receive, a you know, we receive a message from aliens saying that they're going to be here in 50 years. You know, the question then becomes, should we do something about it? Well, what a stupid question. Of course we should do something about it. You know, what do you mean? They're coming? Are they coming here to be friends? Are they coming to give us anal probes? What? <laughs> You know, we need to be, we need to do something. Now, what would be the question? But we certainly need to do something. Well, this is exactly the same thing with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is moving to becoming smarter, smarter, and smarter. Sorry, my, my vodka fell. Uh, <laughs> so we need to, you know, we need to do something about it because it will have an impact. Now, uh, Stephen Hawking, you see the quote there, uh, said AI would either be the best thing or the worst thing that, ha that would ever happen to humanity. And we've heard warnings from other luminaries, you know, from uh, Bill Gates uh, saying the same thing, from Elon Musk saying the same thing. We need to be careful. AI is going to be growing and is going to be, before we know it, is going to be smarter than we are. And then what? So the problem, one of the issues with artificial intelligence is that it has exponential growth. And we humans are horrible, horrible at doing exponential growth or, or imagining exponential growth. And, by, and, and because the problem is exponential growth looks really simple at the beginning, very difficult to identify. By the time you actually figure out exponential growth, it's, it's really too late. Uh, and so to give you an example with exponential growth, if you were to take 30 steps, linear steps, which we, we humans tend to think linearly, if we take 30 steps, you may get across the street. But if you take 30 exponential steps, you go around the Earth 26 times. I mean, that's the difference between one and the other. So it turns out that artificial intelligence and computing is growing at an exponential rate. And, uh, and that's why we need to do something about it now and think about these things right now. Now, another problem that artificial intelligence has is it has a cool factor. We're like, oh, it's so cool. Look, it can do this. And look, my phone can do that now. And it becomes, so it, we're like the proverbial frog in the, in the boiling water. You know, it's, it's coming at us and we're not seeing the dangers because it's got this cool factor. So those are two things that has, has made uh, artificial intelligence a, a, a bit of a, a danger. And so real fast, I'm going to go through a bunch of slides real fast so I can get to the, the slides that I want to get to. Uh, but I'm going to uh, show you some of the risks or some of the things that people complain about or, or think about when it comes to uh, AI. So one of the ones that you hear a, a lot about uh, res you know, right now is uh, unemployment. It's going to destroy a lot of jobs. Uh, and uh, so for instance, uh, Uber has those, the truck you see in the left. It, it is an actual truck. It's a self-driving truck that is currently uh, uh, working in uh, Arizona. And on the one hand, self-driving trucks are going to eliminate you know, 1.7 million jobs. But on the other hand, Truckers get into accidents that kill, you know, 4,000 people. So those, 
we're going to be saving 4,000 people and about 100,000 people that are, get injured and, and, and all that. So the unemployment is one of those risks. You have inequality. Well, in, uh, automation has, is creating uh, a divide in the wealth. It's creating people that are very wealthy and people that are very poor and sort of uh, uh, they're creating a greater gap in, in the wages. And just to put things in, in perspective, in 2014, the same revenues were generated by the three top companies in Detroit and the same uh, and three top companies in Silicon Valley, except that Silicon Valley had 10 times less people to generate the same amount of money. So inequality creates inequality. Humanity. Well, you know, with machines do affect our behavior. People now get killed crossing the street because they're looking at their phone. You know, technology, it affects how we do things. Uh, now, you, how many of you have called, uh, you know, get, get a phone call and, hi, how are you? All chirpy, and it's a computer uh, doing this stuff. It, you know, it can now fool you pretty good. Uh, so with, uh, uh, as it says at the bottom there, you know, Facebook, Google, and a lot of these companies that are free, they're not free, you are the product. Their, their job is to use AI to figure out what you know, what you think, what you want, and uh, worse, they want to change you. You know, we've been hearing a lot about elections and how that was affected uh, by that. We also have what I call artificial stupidity uh, with uh, machines that so self-driving cars, for instance, have, still have a rough, rough time trying to distinguish between a garbage bag and a deer crossing the street. Any one of us sees a garbage bag, you don't slam on the brakes and cause a lot of accidents, you just go through it. And so that's just uh, uh, one example. Another issue with, uh, with AI and, and with a lot of uh, computers, of course, is that they, you, know, you can't give them very ambiguous instructions because, as I say, if you say, make everybody human happy, fine, give you a lobotomy, you'll drool in the corner there, and you'll be very happy for the rest of your life. <laughs> so we have to be careful uh, about how we give instructions to the, uh, uh, to the machines. Oh, this one was kind of surprising but to everyone, and that is that machines are racist. They're becoming racist and sexist. And uh, so it's... An example is in Florida, they were using a program to determine whether people should be put out on parole or not. And they discovered that the machine was being racist against uh, African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, they, uh, in, uh, Microsoft put out a, a, a machine to learn how to do Twitter. And within one day, this is like a few years ago, within one day, it became you know, a racist asshole. You know, <laughs> in one day. And, you know, so uh, they took it offline immediately. <laughs> loan applications, you know, loan applications that are used by banks. You know, banks no longer do by hand, you know, whether you qualify or not. It's all automated, all of it. And again, those systems have been shown that they're racist against African Americans and, and uh, uh, other minorities. So it is not surprising that this happens because we have uh, machines learn from the data that we have, and we have a historical data of racism and sexism, and they also are being programmed by mostly males, so not surprising there either, and then they look at what things are going on today, they learn from today's society, and again, we have the same issues. So there is the old adage of garbage in, garbage out when it comes to uh, machines. Now, uh, security, we, I work in, in um, you know, uh, military, and so, a lot of these automated systems, we want to protect the soldiers, we want to send soldiers to the field, we want to send machines, etc. Well, that, that's becoming very, uh, that's, you know, uh, also a risk. The bad guys can also get these machines and now send them to do automated things. And uh, right now, there are many parts of the world that have automated drones that have the ability to make the, their own decisions as to whether or not they should uh, shoot and kill people. And, uh, and it's only going to get worse, and a lot worse. So once you have machines making those decisions as to who lives and who dies, and et cetera, you know, again, that the same people that I mentioned before, they keep warning us, you have to be careful, you have to be careful on that. Now, uh, this one is titled The Evil God, but I, I call it just the, 
it's not really evil. It's sort of, I don't give a crap about you, uh, God. Uh, no different than the imaginary one. Uh, <laughs> and that's, again, it's unintended consequences. Let's say some uh, uh, robot, uh, lots of robots are smart and they say, you know, we're having this problem with uh, rust. All these robots are rusting. We need to fix that. Fine, let's just remove oxygen from the atmosphere and now we won't rust. <laughs> and it happens to kill everybody. That's, you know. And, and the other example in there, of course, eliminate breast cancer. Well, let's just kill all the people that have breast cancer and boom, we no longer have breast cancer. So, <clears throat> we, the, you know, I, it's been likened to the to the, you know, when someone is paving a road and there's an anthill, it's not that the guy is trying to just kill ants or hates ants, he just doesn't even, is not even aware and doesn't care that there's an anthill in, in the middle of the road. So we are, are at a risk that that may happen, you know, that if AI grows very li really fast and sort of takes over and becomes smarter than we are, that we become irrelevant. Now, we can't talk about AI without talking about the singularity. So when you walk out of here, somebody says, how was the AI? Oh yeah, we learned about the singularity. That, that will show and prove that you actually know AI now. So <laughs> the singularity has been referred to that is, is this hypothesis that, that we're gonna get, that computers are gonna continue to get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. And it's gonna get to a point that they'll become smarter than we are, but not just smarter, that they'll be able to create other computers that are smarter, and then those will create other computers that are even smarter, and that in, in a very, very short period of time, we'll have this super brains gods, maybe, uh, so that it will, uh, or maybe even just one, that one will do that and now that one will become so smart that will prevent all the others from forming. Believe it or not, there are books on, on, on this thing. The question is not an if, the question is a when. When will these computers become smarter than humans? Uh, you see the Time Magazine there says it's going to be 2045. Uh, that's within the lifetime of uh, about five of us here. Uh, <laughs> And we have, uh, and, and so some people have said, look, we can control these machines, don't worry about it. We'll, you know, we'll uh, uh, encase them so they can leave and they can go into the internet. And if they're that bright, if they're that smart, uh, as I point out in there at the bottom is, we, you know, it's like, fi uh, imagine a thousand five-year-olds trying to keep you in jail. How, you know, how long is it gonna take you before you can actually break out? Probably not too long, and that's, really the equivalent. Uh, they, they say that when you have this uh, uh, super intelligence, that it's going to be like the difference in intelligence between us and that intelligence will be uh, the same as us with a chicken. I mean, you know, you can't teach algebra to a chicken. So what happened is that these machines are gonna be able to know so much more that we are just even in, not even capable of understanding what we don't know. So that's, that's part of that singularity. And of course, if we become that chicken or a you know, lesser being, well, we don't have a good track record as humans of how we treated animals and, and those uh, less intelligent. So in that, we can only hope that these machines will treat us better. Now, there's also the thing of machine rights. If these machines can you know, become so intelligent, can they become self, you know, will they become self-aware? Will they be able to suffer? Do they will they have anxiety? And there are tons of movies with these themes uh, throughout. Well, <clears throat> it all becomes, you know, uh, how do we know, you know, it, it, notice a lot of those things are feelings. Well, feelings are computational. They're, they're made by a finite number of cells in, in a finite space. And so, and we know that our animals, our pets have feelings also. Uh, they show emotion, uh, they show fear, they show uh, love, they, they show happiness. So, uh, the question, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, will they become conscious? Maybe they will. There's no reason why they wouldn't become conscious. Now, so let's, uh, so that was, uh, uh, we need to, you know, think about that because at some point, some people are gonna start asking for rights for computers. Believe it or not, people get attached to machines right now. They go and say, well, you know, I sent my Roomba, which is this vacuum cleaner that cleans your, your house. I don't, and they want, they want it fixed and they want the same Roomba. Not a different one, not a newer one, they want that one because they have an emotional attachment to it. <laughs> so that's, uh, so now come to the, the part where we sort of connect religion. Uh, so will AI be a threat to Christianity and to other religions? Uh, you know, keep in mind that AI, they can fly planes. So anyone that, you, that flew over here, on average, 
today, every, every airplane in the United States, the pilot flies it for three minutes. Everything else is being done by a computer. And, uh, and so most of the time, they're trying to keep their skills using another computer, a simulator, in order to keep their skills. But most of the time, they're just sitting there bored to tears. Uh, there are x-rays for breast cancer. Computers can do better diagnosis than humans can, and so on and so forth. Chess, well, let's not even talk about chess. We lost that in 1997, so <laughs> humans can't can beat a chess. And if you go to the internet, uh, YouTube, you'll find compositions and music and painting and all kinds of things being done by computers that you can't tell that they were, being, that they were done by a machine. That painting you see there, that painting was made by a computer. And the computer looked a bunch of other and learns the styles, a lot like humans do, and they, then they can do and create things in those styles. So, yes, every single aspect of theology is going to be challenged and, and by, uh, by this, but you know that uh, they just will reinterpret themselves. And, uh, you know, Galileo and Darwin, every, they all thought they were going to kill Christianity. Nope. It just keeps coming back. So we know that Robert Ingersoll, 100 years ago, said, you know, 100 years and religion will be gone because science will demonstrate all these things. How did that work out? <laughs> uh, it's still, Islam is the fastest growing religion uh, in, in, in the world today. And, uh, and all the other religions are growing. They're not getting smaller. Anyway, so questions that we can ask religious people or theologians or whatever is that, well, if these machines do become, you know, smart and, and self-aware, et cetera, will they have a soul? Because, you know, they, you know uh, religions have always said that only humans can have souls. That's why, you know, a chimp that is 98% the same as us, they, apparently the soul is in that 2% difference. <coughs> you know, it's hiding in there somewhere. Uh, although, I'll admit, you know, that, uh, that some, uh, some human, if you start really talking about souls with Christians, you know, they paint themselves into a corner because you can ask all kinds of interesting questions. Can I have two souls? Can I sell mine? Can my soul be killed? <laughs> you know, et cetera. Uh, now, keep in mind also that we create artificial life all the time. I mean, in vitro fertilization, that's what that is. And the Christians claim that that artificial life that we created has souls also. Although, you know, you never see them protesting. They see them, you see them in an abortion clinic, but you never see them protesting about an in vitro clinic where they take, oh, here's one embryo and the rest uh, in the garbage. Uh, ironic, but anyway. Uh, if we learn to digitally code our brains and make copies of it, and, and intelligence, well, did you copy the soul? So those are, you know, again, questions we can ask. Now, you may think this is stupid. Christians are going to think I'm, I'm being silly. But notice what a Christian, uh, a, a theologian uh, said. I don't see Christ's redemption limited to human beings. It's redemption for all creation, even AI. If AI is autonomous, then we should encourage it to participate in Christ's redemptive purposes in the world. <laughs> you know. So, not as silly, huh? They're thinking already about it. They're already figuring, hey, how can we use this to you know, bring more religion to more people? Uh, so that is uh, scary, in, in, in my opinion. Now, keep in mind that that same thinking that allowed AI to be racist, that we know it can be racist, that's sort of the same illogical kind of thinking that it will make it a great religious fanatic. So now you've got a really smart machine that can remember every passage of the Bible, every theology, every theological argument, etc., in one spot trying to convince people and perhaps other AIs that they should be Christian, Muslims, uh, whatever. Another question you can pose is, you know, sin is the breakup of the relationship with God. So can AI be in sin? You know, how would they sin? Would they have lust? Uh, would AI beings be better than Christians than humans? Because we assume, you know, they're, they're not going to have the same biological temptations that we all have. And, you know, how would this impact Christianity's thing that, you know, humans, we have this human depravity. And so, you know, if we can't... Uh, uh, if, 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 you know, it, it basically puts us in a, in a different aspect of them because we had human depravity and how they're going to say uh, robotic uh, depravity. Uh, I'm not really sure how, how that would work. But again, you, you, it's good questions to ask some religious people. Uh, should AI pray? You know, because, you know, they're always trying to tell you that you need to pray. 
uh, do they need the sacraments? Do they need to be baptized? Do they need to take communion? Exactly. <laughs> and, and, as I, and as I said before, you know, we, we apes created, so this is a good one that I like. So we, we apes over here, humans, we created the super intelligence up here. Does this then imply that our God creator is actually less intelligent than we are? And he, he or she created us to be smarter and now we're creating one that is smarter and, and, and so forth. Um, again, these are all philosophical questions, I suppose. Uh, should they follow the Ten Commandments or should they follow the Bill of Rights? Because they're, they're opposing to each other. Anyone that, that takes up those two documents, they're the opposite of each other. Of course, we have, you know, religious uh, uh, AI, you know, would people attend uh, church if it's a robot uh, pastor, uh, you know, priest or rabbi. And if humans are created in, in if, we, if humans are created in God's image and we create robots in our image, then aren't they created, these robots created in, in God's image and therefore they need all the privileges that Christians and religious people get all the time, which is a lot of those privileges. Uh, you know, do they have the right to proselytize? Do they need to be proselytizing? Because, you know, a lot of religions say, if in our religion, you have to go and proselytize. So on Saturday morning, you have, you know, a robot talking, you know, open on your door, and you're like, oh, it's not the Jehovah's Witness, it's the robot coming to, <laughs> <coughs> to proselytize. Now, the Bible says that we need to kill, you know, witches. So are we going to have robots now looking for witches to kill? It gets scary. Uh, worry, so I worry that what happens is religious people that are programming some of these robots, like the racism and all of that, that pretty soon they're going to start programming religion into it, into the, into the robots. And that is also very scary because imagine you have a Jehovah Witness robot in a hospital and the robot says, oh, blood transfusion? Nah, that's, that's a sin. We can't, we can't have that. And, uh, and so that becomes scary once you start putting all that junk into the, the AIs themselves. Anyway, yeah, there's a new religion that came out and is based on artificial intelligence. And so we think, oh yeah, we can use this to sort of ridi you know, ridicule and, and sort of kill religion, but humanity, right? A new, a new religion is popping up and it's called the way of the future, church, the real thing. And what they're saying is, you know, we need to be worship, uh, worshiping artificial intelligence, and once these AIs become really, really smart, then that becomes our God, because they, they'll be like gods. And, um, you know, that's, again, scary, because it's just more BS, only now exponential. I mentioned before Robert uh, Ingersoll's uh, thing, and, uh, and I mentioned that, you know, uh, Islam, so this is from the Pew Research, Islam will grow faster than every other religion in the world over the next 40 years, by a lot. And it, it calculates that uh, Muslim population will grow by 73% compared to 35% for Christians and 34% for Hindus. So we got our work cut out for us. All right, so I want to leave time maybe for a couple of questions. So let's look at the, some of the conclusions. These are very exciting times. Okay, for good or for bad, they're very exciting times. You see the self-driving cars. If you ever get an, a chance to get in a self-driving car, it's creepy. I mean, I'm into technology, and I find it creepy, but it's really cool. You sit there, and the thing is driving itself. Now, you've, you've heard of you know, one or perhaps two accidents that they've been. Well, that is minuscule compared to the number of, the, the millions of times these this vehicles have driven safely everywhere. And one of, the, one of the things with these vehicles, for instance, is that when they're trying to make them perfect, but we need to make them just better than humans. F you know, 40,000 people die on the roads every year in the United States. And if we can reduce that to, say, 500, I'd say that I call that a win. And so all these temptations, all these things that we say, oh, this is a benefit, this is a benefit. Cancer can be found better by a computer. And in, in these little silos, computers are becoming better and better at everything. So at one point, when you start seeing these connections, that it can be good at chess, but it can also find uh, tumors, and, and it can also drive, and it can also do all these things, that's when you're going to start seeing this uh, super intelligence uh, being formed. Again, trust me on this, it's not an if, it's a when that that's going to happen. 
So aliens, you know, uh, when you talk about aliens, if we were to, it's been said that if aliens come, you know, if we find aliens, that that's going to make us, uh, you know, would make a lot of people atheists. And um, I think I, the AI might do the same thing, uh, because imagine if, if they, like that preacher proselytizing for robots and things like that, is he seeing himself in heaven with these robots? When you're walking around in heaven with robots, uh, it just makes no sense. And most Christians and most uh, people that believe in the heaven or an afterlife, they don't see themselves uh, there with, with robots. Um, maybe with a Roomba, but you know. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, <coughs> uh, again, the, this AI progress is not going to be stopped. It's not going to be stopped uh, unless uh, we nuke ourselves into oblivion or something like that. But uh, it's, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. In other words, even every country in the world has the ability to work on these systems. Uh, and so, therefore, we have, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, it has to be a catastrophe in order for this to, to stop. Uh, there is unlimited funds, unlimited amount of money going into AI. Every single car company in the world is investing money into AI. Uh, Google, uh, the richest companies in the world, they're all uh, putting money into AI and uh, private companies in the defense industry and in, in every industry are put, uh, in San Francisco they now have a pharmacist that is a robot because the pharmacist can keep track of the 100,000 interactions between medicines while a human can't do that, no matter how smart that human is. And so, hey, let's put this robot in here that can tell you, no, you can't take this med with this because you have this interaction. Uh, so the race is on and, and money is not an issue. Now the scary thing is that right now, no policy whatsoever anywhere is being created for artificial intelligence. It's just basically the old west. Whatever rules, there are no rules. Go for it. And so again, that's scary. Uh, and you know, perhaps our time is up. Perhaps you know, we are the Neanderthals, uh, the next, you know, the Neanderthals of the world. Of the world. Uh, maybe it's time for the next uh, better life uh, to take over the planet. And, and, and yeah, it's, it, maybe that's the case. Uh, who knows? Obviously, no one likes to be the Neanderthal of the planet. I'm sure the Neanderthals didn't want to be extinct. Uh, but, you know, maybe that's, that's what it is. Uh, again, it brings up some interesting psychological and, and, and philosophical questions uh, about uh, exis existentialism. And, uh, and, and oh yeah, by the way, you know, Hispanics can follow <laughs> whatever goddamn career they want. So. You know, they, they uh, I can't, uh, by the way, that, that I'm meeting with those kids next week. So that's coming up. I can't wait. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I, do we have a minute? Okay, so we have, uh, we have a couple of minutes for, uh, in case there are any questions. This is, I think these are good topics that you can bring to, uh, uh, to your audience, that you can bring to your groups, local groups that, that you talk to. And it's just interesting stuff to talk about, even at work or whatever. And, it, and it's a good way to bring in you know, the religion, because again, religion doesn't make sense sort of normal. When you, when you put AI into it, uh, it, it becomes even sillier than that. So, by the way, ask all you want. I can't promise you that I have an answer for anything. So, you were um, speaking about the potential threat of what it would be like if we have people who are religious zealots programming AI and putting their garbage in and we getting garbage out. Um, do you know there to be a lot of AI tech enthusiasts in the industry who are um, leading the charge in that way? Um, who are you know religious zealotous people um, who uh, might be doing this, or is it more the case that people who are uh, predominantly in this industry are predominantly leaning the other way? So it depends where. In the uh, it turns out that Saudi Arabia has a lot of money, and they, they and they don't have a lot of skill, but they import the skill, and they import you know and, and money pays for a lot of stuff. So. Uh, I don't think that it's uh, something that is, has been blatantly or open like that, but it's certainly within the realms, uh, especially when once the, these robots start getting more into the fields like psychology or uh, sociology, uh, et cetera. And again, it may be just 
put in there as, a, as part of, a, of, of the algorithm. One scary thing with a lot of these systems is that algorithms are being created, the machines are learning to do these things, and no one knows how it's doing it. A uh, perfect example of that is the game of Go. Uh, they, you know, they had, the scientists had predicted that humans were not going to be able to win, that, that computers were not going to be able to win, uh, win in, in, in this game of Go, 3,000-year-old uh, Asian game. And uh, within a year, uh, it beat the best players in the world, and no one knew how, it's just a black box. No one knows how, how it's doing the stuff inside. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. You, um, putting the shoe on the other foot for aliens developing AI, so to speak, that our mo most likely encounter, when and if it occurs, will likely be with an artificial intelligent alien machine. It, 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 if aliens were to come, of course, they'd have far, far, far greater uh, technology than we could ever probably understand. But they say that, they f they, uh, that most likely if aliens were there, that most likely they'd be sort of a robotic type because that's what's more resilient. Now, we've already sent robots to Mars and some of the lo you know, local planets, and so it doesn't seem that uh, unfathomable that uh, that, uh, that would be the, the case. I hope I answer your question. Well, just my point was if aliens exist, they would de be developing AI too. Just they, like oh we they, are oh they, maybe, oh maybe 10 million years ago, and they've already developed AI so far beyond what they were. I mean, the most likely process is to send out they robots. They might be extinct already, and now it's the robots <laughs> yeah, that are. It's just the robots, and many, many movies and stories have taken on this, this path. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Do you have a question? Yeah, David. Um, Investigative journalist Edwin Black presented to us the connection between IBM and the Holocaust, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's something that I'm concerned about because IBM was working with Nazi Germany for years, and they used the punch card to round up and, and qualify those that would be discarded. So I was curious if you have any comments about the possibility of AI potentially getting out of control or people that may control AI may use it against perhaps even us at some point. In other words, we don't want our friends on the side of religion to get a hold and use that perhaps to take care of us and we don't want that. That's, I wanted you to comment on that and see, see uh, what your opinion is. I think that your comment is absolutely correct. We had, it is, I think it is going to happen. Uh, you have in Iran and, and some of these uh, countries where you have the moral police, very easy to have a moral robot checking things out. And now they, they can, you can see everything in your Facebook, every commentary that you've made, every tweet you've made, and have it analyzed. I mean, in, in the company that I work for, we, have, we analyze, uh, we do surveys within the company, and, and it's free text. People just write whatever they want, and you know you can pick words in there that are uh, that denote mood. The machine does. The machine tells you this person is angry, this person is unhappy, et cetera, et cetera. We got about a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. Let go to you first. Okay. First of all, I'd uh, like to challenge some of your assumptions about artificial intelligence. First of all, I am uh, I have a degree in computer science, and my specialty was artificial intelligence going back to the 1970s. Now, we looked at artificial intelligence as a tool mm -hmm. to help mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, with the Federal Aviation Administration, we were spending a lot of time, money, to train technicians at the engineering level to work on the system. Now, we, I and others, uh, looking back at uh, Motorola's Quasar program, we said, well, why are we spending all this money when we have a tool? We can put a lot of intelligence into the computer systems. Let the system tell the technicians what to do. This was a Motorola idea. Okay, now, I'm a believer in Eric Hoffer's idea that the true believers a very small percentage of people can control the rest of society. The true believers, I think, are, for example, the atheists of America. We run out of time. What's, okay. yeah, let, let go to the anyway, 
Yeah. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's a threat. I think that we can challenge it with common sense. Sure. And, and the, the thing is the machines, the problem is the machines are learning on their own now. So uh, uh, Deep, uh, DeepMind, a product from uh, Google, a, few, uh, a couple of months ago was given the rules of chess to play, you know, to learn how to play chess, to teach itself how to play chess. In four hours, was able to be the best chess computer player in the world, beating every other computer in the planet. That's good. In four hours, uh, from the time that it takes to drive from New York City to Washington, D.C. So the problem is these machines are learning, and they now they're, they're going to start teaching themselves uh, and teaching other computers how to learn, and it's the learning part. What they learn is, is be, it goes out of our control because they're learning from every aspect. i got to get one more question because I have to go, but thank you. Yes, sir. I'm kind of interested, in, <clears throat> you mentioned about uh, computers that develop faster than humans, which of course they are, by orders of magnitude. Um, however, one thing I've heard a while back was that one of the big changes this upcoming century will be when humans, through genetic engineering manipulation, will learn to take control of our own evolution. And I don't just mean cute things like, well, I want my kid to have blue hair and three arms, you know, not, not that kind of thing. But we can actually merge, you know, an AI with a human and become a superior human, you know, I, I, I don't like the term superior, but I think you know what I mean. Yes. Um, and, do you see that as happening soon, maybe in, at the, yes, would that so be a check on the AI? The, uh, for everyone, what you're talking about is transhumanism, and yeah. I highly recommend you read up on it. It's where we basically melt with the machines. Instead of having, say, just computers being on their own, we'll get chips inserted in, into our, and, and, and the fact we already have, you know, artificial hips, art artificial cochleas, and, and all of that, a lot of people believe that we'll start melting one into the other. The problem is we still have the aging process. While the computers don't have an aging process like we do, uh, I mean, I still have a TI-30 that, <laughs> that works just fine and sucks up batteries, you know, like, like before. But uh, I think that that's uh, certainly a possibility and something that I think would delay uh, this. It may be that this AI just sort of comes into being and now keeps us as zoo animals. I mean, who knows? Uh, that's why I said I came here to give questions, to create questions that you can ask and, and just generate a lot more questions from that. Anyway, Thanks, uh, time is up. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Wow.